so there's this YouTube channel called Cracking the Cryptic, and I watch them do Sudoku puzzles. The central square sees what needs to, we need to make 15 more ways than any other cell with the central square, because the central square is part of a co- And I thought it would be fun to solve like a physics problem. I'm going to do a problem from this book. Princeton Problems in Physics. Uh, so this, this book is intended, I think, as a study guide for a qualifying exam at Princeton. If you go to grad school, you have to qualify before you become a PhD candidate. So at some schools, that's taking a bunch of courses and doing like a mini thesis presentation. Sometimes it's doing like four exams on different topics. I assume Princeton Physics has the four exams in different topics, at least in 1991 when this book was written, because that's how this book is set up. This book is intended to be solved by anyone with like a bachelor's degree amount of knowledge in physics. I don't know about that. I got it because someone told me it would help me study for the physics GRE and I would say instead don't go to a school that requires the physics GRE. We hate the ETS here. We want them out of business. That That's that's the goal. So don't do that. Um, but like these are fun. They're fun problems. I'm going to do, in case you're reading along, uh, a dynamics problem 1.3. Let me read it to you. The science fiction writer R.A. Heinlein describes a skyhook satellite that consists of a long rope placed in orbit at the equator aligned along a radius from the center of the Earth and moving so that the rope appears suspended in space above a fixed point on the equator, figure 1.2. The bottom of the rope hangs free just above the surface of the Earth, the radius R. Assuming that the rope has uniform mass per unit length and that the rope is strong enough to resist breaking, find the length of the rope. Okay. So I am going to solve this problem on my tablet, which will be over here, and I'll put my little face in the corner just because people seem to like that better, which I don't really get because I'm just going to be like this the whole time, but that that's fine. I will do that for you. Let's set up this problem. Okay, so we have the earth. That's a nice little earth. It has some radius R, and attached to the very, very crust of the earth, we have this long rope that has some length L. And the only other piece of information they give us about this is that it has a constant mass density, which means that the total mass of the rope divided by the length of the rope is equal to if we had like a little section of this rope with some mass M1 divided by some length L1, these two things would be equal. So it's always constant. Great. And they say find L. This is kind of what I like about physics, like you don't have very much information and they're like, you know, you know the, the laws of physics, just just find L. So if you want to solve this yourself, I would stop here, um, solve it, jump to this timestamp for the answer and discussion, or we can go through this together. And if you want to solve this to like brush up on your solving physics problem skills, I would really recommend grabbing a piece of paper and actually copying it down because it's really easy to watch someone solve a problem, but you're not gonna get it in your brain unless you're also writing it. So where I usually start with these problems is with Newton's laws. So the force on an object is equal to its mass times acceleration. The thing about this rope, let me put up a GIF so you can get a picture in your head. It is, it is moving, but it is not speeding up or slowing down. It has some constant rotation. So the sum of the forces on that object must be zero. And if we look at our little piece of rope again, you have the earth and you have this little guy and we can draw a force diagram. We know that gravity is pulling down and I'm gonna call this the centrifugal force and it's pushing up. Um, the centrifugal force is a fictitious force. It is because of the rotation that this rope is also experiencing a force that kind of pushes it away. Think about when you're in a car and you take like a really hard turn and you feel your body kind of do this, that's the same thing. Uh, you might have seen the trick where people fill a bucket with water and then they spin it and the water gets pushed against the bucket and doesn't fall out. That's the centrifugal force. It's not a real force, it's, it's a thing that happens because of rotation. And it's like a whole semantics argument, which I don't really care about, but I, I do recognize that some people care about that. And I, I feel for you, like I'm also a semantics person. So are you in the comments below about that? I'm going to call it the centrifugal force. And I'm also going to hope that that's the correct one. I'm going to go with it. Okay. It's centrifugal force.
So we know that those two things must be equal. So we can set this up as like fc equals fg, and these are both vectors, but I'm gonna lose those pretty quick. And we know what these forces are. We have the little mass of our little guy times omega squared times this whole distance to the center of motion here, which is just gonna call it r1. And that will be equal to the gravitational force, which is G, times big M, which is the mass of the Earth, times our little m, divided by that same R1 squared. So the idea here could be that we have our Earth, we have our long rope, and since we can solve this, we could just add up all these little guys. And of course, the smaller you make these little pieces, the more accurate your result is, until you've got these tiny infinitesimals that you're adding up. And this should scream that we should have to do an integral. Oh, that's supposed to be an integral sign. This should tell you that we have to do an integral. So rather than adding up infinitesimal things, you just wanna integrate over the length of the rope. If you don't know calculus, this is the only calculus we're gonna do. And you just need to trust me when I say that if you have an infinite sum, you should just do an integral. But there's this really good video I think his name is three blue, one brown. I'll link it below where he just does this in like 15 minutes. So uh, pause this, go watch that and come back if you're not comfortable with the integral. So I can now rewrite this box with two integrals where I go from mass to my, my density over the entire length of the rope. Rather than doing a sum of all the little masses, I can sum over the entire length. So we get omega squared r times rho dr is equal to g m over r squared times rho dr. And I can replace my densities because it's a constant density with the total mass of the rope divided by the total length of the rope. And I can pull out all my constants and rewrite this and we get m omega squared over l times the integral of r dr is equal to g m m over l times the integral of one on r squared dr okay i'm going to call this one and call this integral two and solve these separately and then come back because you, remember our goal is to solve for this l here so we need to do these integrals so let's start with one we have the integral of r dr, and this actually is not an indefinite integral. We are going to go from this distance to this distance, the entire length of the rope. So we will start at r and go to r plus l. So I can actually write the limits right here. Now, if you are scared of calculus and you look at this integral of r dr and you're just like blanking your brain and you don't want to do it, I want you to know that we could solve this analytically. We could do the proof to get the answer to what this integral is, but no one ever actually does that. You do it, I mean, you do do it one time in class, but as a working physicist who does integrals at work, I don't ever look at this and start doing like the fundamental theorem of calculus. I have the power rule of integration memorized and I just plug it in. Let me give you an example. The same way you have something like this and you have the order of operations memorized so you can just solve this this is not scary for you because you know what to do like you know you have to do four times two divided by two so you go now you go left to right so it's eight divided by two which is four you can just do that because you have whatever PEMDAS or whatever they say you have that memorized the exact same way you would do that I have the power rule of integration memorized. Yes, gun to my head, I could prove it if you needed me to, but in real life, I never need to do that. Calculus is not scary. You just gotta learn it. You learn the theory one time and then it's just in your brain forever and it's really fun to just solve the problems. So let me, let me tell you about the power rule of integration. So the power rule of integration says if I have some integral that's x to the n dx, that is gonna be equal to one over n plus 1 times x to the n plus 1 plus some constant. What we have is the integral of r dr. So we get 1 over 1 plus 1 times r to the 1 plus 1. 
we're not going to have that constant because we have a definite integral. So we're just going to evaluate it at the two ends of our curve. So what we get is r squared over 2 evaluated from r to r plus l. Great. So now we can just do this, right? So you have r plus l squared over 2 minus r squared over 2. And I guess we should do the algebra. Nah. Okay, so we get r squared plus 2lr plus l squared minus r squared all over 2. So these cancel. So the solution to our one integral is going to be lr plus l squared on 2. Nice. Okay, let me remember what 2 is. 1 on r squared dr. Okay, so now we can solve 2 where we have the integral of r to r plus l. I'm just going to rewrite that as r to the minus 2 dr. And oh my gosh, we can use our power rule again. Ooh, I'm going to highlight something really quick here. Hang on. So this only works if n is not equal to minus 1. So just keep that in mind. Okay, but luckily our rn here is equal to minus 2, so we can use the power rule to solve this problem where we will get 1 on minus 2 plus 1 times r to the minus 2 plus 1, and we will evaluate that from r to r plus l. Great, so we get minus 1 on r plus l minus minus 1 on r. Uh, so this becomes a plus, and now we have to find the common denominator. So we get minus r over r times r plus l plus r plus l over r times r plus l. Uh, so these r's cancel, and so our number 2 integral is equal to l over r times r plus l. Great. So we can plug both of those back into our equation here. So we have m omega squared on l times 1, which was lr plus l squared on 2, and that's equal to g big M little m over l times l on r. Let's just multiply this out so we get r squared plus lr. Great. Um, so this L cancels this L and one of those. This L cancels this L. We have an M on both sides, so we can cancel those. So let's rewrite this where all the L's are on one side and our constant stuff is on the other side. So we get R plus L on 2 multiplied by R squared plus LR equal to G big M, the mass of the earth, divided by omega squared. So this is kind of the answer, right? <laughs> like we know g is a gravitational constant. We know the mass of the earth. We know that omega is equal to two pi, one rotation over 24 hours to the minus one. So we know r is our earth. We could just solve for l. If I was giving this as a test problem and you got this far, it, it's fine, right? You solved it, hooray. <laughs> but let, let's, let's go a little bit further. Let's, uh, so let's multiply this out. So we get r cubed plus one half r squared l plus r squared l plus one half r l squared all equal to gm over omega squared. And I'm going to rearrange this so we're decreasing in powers of l. Um, no, first I'm going to multiply everything by 2 because I'm not dealing with fractions. Screw that. So we get 2r cubed plus r squared l plus 2r squared l plus rl squared equals 2gm over omega squared. Now I will organize it in powers of decreasing l. So I'm going to cross these out as I go so I can keep track. So we get rl squared plus r, this gives us plus 3 r squared l plus I'm going to put a big bracket here and do 2r cubed and then I'm going to bring this over to this side and say minus 2gm 
over omega squared is equal to zero. Now, now you should recognize right away exactly how to solve this, right? What we have is ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero. And when I write this down, sometimes people start singing a song to me. I never learned songs in math class, so I'm kind of jealous. But we know that x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a, where a is r, this is b, and then c is this whole thing. Now again, you can stop here. We've, we've solved the problem. I, I think I might just skip all of my algebra. Feel free to plug this in and solve it yourself and make sure that you get the same answer I do, but here's my answer. L is equal to minus 3 halves r plus the square root of 1 fourth r squared plus 2 times gm over r squared times r over omega squared. It's still under the square root. Great. Now, I wrote this this way because we know that gm over r squared for Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared. And we know that the radius of the Earth is 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters. We know that omega is, as I said before, 2 pi, one full rotation in a day, 24 hours minus 1. And that is equal to 7.3 times 10 to the minus 5 seconds to the minus one because you need everything to be in meters and seconds and when you all plug this in you get 1.5 times 10 to the 8 meters great that's it that's the answer that is l so we did it just for comparison the distance to the moon is 3.95 times 10 to the 8 meters so this the skyhook thing has to be a little less than halfway to the moon we did it so sometimes these are called space elevators and it's not just a hook like you have some space station that's attached to the end. Sometimes there's a counterweight far away that like keeps the cable taut. Sometimes there's a little crawler to crawl up the rope and that's the elevator. And the idea is that you would take stuff from Earth and, and elevate it to space. Great. Okay, so we we just did, no time has passed, a problem about a sky hook. Usually, though, these things have stations attached to the end, and maybe further out they have like a massive object as like a counterweight, and you could attach a cable car or something to the cable and move things up to space. Like it's a space elevator. You could take things and move them up. I don't know why you would want to do that. More on that later. Of course, all of those things will change the very simple problem we just did. Like adding a giant mass at the end is going to affect everything else, right? And then having a cable. Let, let's talk about some of the engineering issues that would come up if you actually wanted to build a space elevator. Now, let me be clear here. I'm not debunking space elevators. Like anybody who ever sat down to think about this for like 10 minutes would come up with all of these same things. It's just like a conversation, like between bros, right? First, let's talk about the cable because in this problem, it says, assuming the rope is strong enough to resist breaking exclamation point. Like that, that's the biggest problem with these things. You need this rope that's super strong to withstand its own weight over this huge distance that that material doesn't actually exist. So you could never actually make a space elevator, even though there's so many companies pretending like, oh, 2041, no, no. H here is what I was thinking about. Um, imagine this cable exists. Like it's, it's a brilliant magic invention of unobtainium, it's fine. How do you, how do you keep the cable from breaking? 
Like it has to be taut enough that something could climb up it, but it's also going to be hit by stuff in space. Like radiation of course but then you have like you know all these billionaires that the world is just letting them throw garbage into space and they're like we're gonna save the world and it's like no it's just do you think that spacex of the future based on your experience with elon musk companies do you think spacex of the future will do a planned descent of all seven hundred thousand stupid little satellites they've put in space do you think that they're tracking that? And they're just, they're, they're definitely responsible. They can be trusted to make sure that those land safely in the ocean or whatever. No, that garbage is gonna kill someone and we're just letting them do it. But those are also just all in space. Space is filled with garbage. We actually ruined everything. So you have this cable, like it's really small. It's really thin, but I imagine it's gonna get hit with stuff. Like how do you stop it from breaking? You know, those skyscrapers in Japan that are, designed to wobble in earthquakes so rather than the the seismic wave hitting the structure and like breaking it it like absorbs it a little bit and kind of waves until it can get rid of that energy you would have to do something like that but then i was just thinking about oscillations like what happens if you get a little tiny wiggle in your rope and then it starts going absolutely nuts uh, have you seen the tacoma bridge i'll put a video here as you can see, this bridge was exceptionally long and narrow, over half a mile long, only 39 feet wide. It lasted just four months. Like, what if you're on the space elevator and it just starts, how do you prevent that? What, what, over what distance? Like, you would have to monitor this, but how would you stop it? from oscillating. I guess if you had your counterweight, you could like maybe attach some rockets to it and send it out to pull it taut again. I don't know, it seems wild and weird. And what's weird to me is when you read articles about space elevators, they act like this isn't a problem. Like they'll just be like, space elevators are closer than you think. And it's like, how? What? What's the proof of concept of this? What? Um, but that's fine. Like you can just pretend that it's the future and we have this crazy, cool, unimaginable rope that exists now and don't worry about oscillations it's fine we solved that problem i also think about powering the car like this thing has to move up right and it's probably gonna have like some sort of gear that like climbs and climbs and climbs but you have you have to power that like elevators are not magic you have to take that mass and move it upward like you have to pay gravity you can't not pay gravity so if you have your elevator and it's climbing to outer space like yeah gravity becomes less important as you go up but you still have to to move it up you have to do something and so you i, I don't think i I don't, I don't understand it would be super expensive to move it up but you also have to power it back down right like you move it up to this place where it's like stable and it will just orbit and it's fine but you have to send the car back down to earth, right? And so you would think like, oh, you could just push it and then gravity will pull it down, but it's gonna come down at some terminal velocity and just explode the earth. So you would also have to power it to slow its acceleration so that it comes down at a reasonable speed. So like batteries, I guess. And then once you get into space, you could deploy like some sort of solar panel thing. Like that's how the ISS is powered. They have these big solar panels, but then it's going to be so slow. Like we're talking 20 days to get from earth to wherever this is. And that's just so long. Like, would it really save that much money compared to just a rocket, which takes like an hour or two hours or whatever? Oh, I, I'm, I'm just checking my notes because I, I was trying to figure out how they would power these. And I'm guessing it's going to be some combination of batteries and solar panels. But I, I wrote down magnets, LOL, just because magnets are really heavy. Like, no, if you're carrying a thousand kilograms up to space, so you're going to need this huge honking magnet. There's no way the rope could withstand the magnet. Magnets are very heavy. And then I landed on rockets. Like, you attach a rocket to your elevator and you move it up the cable and then you come back down and you have the rockets to like slow the descent so that you come down at a normal speed but then it's just rockets again so how are you powering it i don't understand like of course they just mean like oh it'll just take 20 days or 10 days 
but I just don't understand how that's that's better. You read these articles about space elevators and they're written as if it's a factual thing that's happening and not a science fiction thing. And so they're like, these elevators, they're gonna be more reliable and better than rockets. And I'm just like, we're pretty good with rockets. I don't know, like, yeah, on earth, I would rather take an elevator than use a jet pack to get to the third floor, but I, I'm not getting on a space elevator. No, no, I, I would rather go on the rocket, which they've done a bunch of times. Oh, how are you? How are you? Why? <laughs> why does anyone want a space elevator? Okay, uh, and then I was thinking the safety. Just someone would have to build this, right? And you would have to have maintenance on it. You would have to go and check your carbon fiber unobtainium nanotube for like kinks and like if it's breaking, if radiation has damaged it and weakened it somehow. Like, how would you do that? What would happen if your cable snapped? Because if nothing's pulling the car up anymore, it's just gonna slam into earth and kill a bunch of people on the ground. And that's, that's no good. You know how sometimes people are like, I thought we were in the future. I thought we would have flying cars by now. And it's like, well, we do have flying cars. They're called helicopters and they crash all the time. I'm not getting in a helicopter. I mean, I guess if it was like an emergency fly out situation and it wasn't my choice, I would probably get in a helicopter, but never by choice would I get in a helicopter and I would never get in a space elevator. That seems crazy dangerous. Like maybe there are some brave souls that will test it for 35 years before, before I get in the space elevator. But what happens if the cable snaps? What's the backup situation? I don't understand. Are people getting in these elevators or are they just for cargo? What's stopping them from slamming into the ground? I was shocked to learn that people are super into space elevators. Uh, spoilers, I have already recorded this video. I recorded it like three weeks ago and then I was editing it and I realized that I was talking about these like they don't actually exist and why would anyone ever want them? And then I was reading, just checking my facts, you know, and a lot, a lot of people want a space elevator and they're talking about it like it's a near future thing, which is absolutely ridiculous, but also hilarious. But why? Like all pie in the sky engineering is very fun, but like engineering is real shit. Engineering is like safety and regulations and test after test after test. Are you getting on a space elevator? That seems crazy to me. You know, speaking of structural failures, have you guys heard of the Hyatt disaster? It's like the greatest structural failure, loss of human life outside 9-11 and like some factory fire a long time ago. And these people, are on like a human path, like a walkway, a bridge, and they're just like dancing and jumping and having a party and three floors of concrete just fell and crushed hundreds of people and like a hundred people died. And this is, this is what engineers think about. You know, engineers are dealing with human life and engineers understand that humans are not just bags of meat that you can shove into a concrete elevator attached to a wire that doesn't exist and just accelerate them to terminal velocity like as if their body won't liquefy. When people talk about this, I feel like they're talking to scientists instead of engineer and scientists are like, yeah, maybe this could happen. I just did the equation. And it's just like, we gotta get the engineers in here. I don't think any of these articles about how close it actually is to, to get a space elevator have any input from actual engineers because engineering is real shit, you know. By the way, should I turn this channel into a structural failure channel? Would that be interesting? I'm just kidding, I bet that already exists. Link your favorite structural failure channel below. Link to their Hyatt disaster video because I wanna watch that. So the spoiler from before is that I'm gonna say something very vulnerable, it's fine. I don't understand why anyone wants a space elevator. I, I don't, why? Um, I was very flippant in the previous version of this video. So now instead I would like to pose it as a question. If you're super into space elevators, why? Why is that? I can think of a few reasons, but none of them make sense. The, the first is that people are picturing like a Star Trek scenario. Like, of course we need a space elevator because we are gonna build an intergenerational interstellar ship and it has to be huge. And you can't build that on the planet. You have to build it in space. So we need to bring the materials up. And it's like, okay, but we don't live in Star Trek. We're, we're not even close 
to, to interstellar travel, it took like 45 years for that little tiny probe to leave the solar system. Like we're not anywhere near interstellar travel. There's no need to build the Star Trek ship. That We don't live in that reality. The space elevator to achieve that goal, it seems like instead we should work on, I don't know, galactic navigation. We don't even know how to do that. We can't send a probe to another star system and slingshot it off our space elevator. We don't know how to navigate to that. And we certainly don't know how to navigate it back to get the data back. We don't know where the Earth will be in 400 years. It's a chaotic dynamic problem. I don't know, maybe 400 years is too small of a time. Let's, let's change it. We don't know where the Earth will be in like 8,000 years. We, we can't do that math. It's, it's nonlinear dynamics. We cannot accurately predict where other stars will be in the time it would take for us to get to them. So we're not in Star Trek. We, we don't need a space elevator. And then there's like the science reason, right? Like you, you build the, the telescope or whatever in space and you can shoot it farther because it's higher up and you don't have to worry about aerodynamics or anything. But like, I mean, we already, we just did the JWST thing with rockets. Like we're pretty good at that. Do we really want to invest $17 billion conservatively into a space elevator in order to just do the thing we can already do with rockets that we're pretty good at? Like, I, I, I don't think the cost would ever justify the success in getting the, the rocket to wherever. Although if you're, if you're going to believe these articles, it'll only cost $4 billion and, and we'll do it by 2032. And it's going to say it's a $500 per kilogram. So, okay. But the next thing I was thinking is like billionaire tourism, just like, like, you remember like the Titan thing, just the same thing, but in space, except now they will hurt actual people when the elevator collapses down onto the island people that live on the island that the billionaire stole to build the stupid thing. Um, but my last reason, in my opinion, is the most realistic reason. And also, I am going to admit that my brain has been rotted by like the evils of capitalism. So every time someone suggests a future thing, my brain immediately goes to like, oh, this is terrible. This is terrible. Let me give you an example. Our fridge broke and that sucks because you got to go buy a fridge and it costs like $2,000. And we're looking at the fridges and they're like, this is a $2,000 fridge. And then they're like, but this one is only $1,600. And it's got a camera inside and it connects to an app on your phone. And if you're at the grocery store and you're a psycho, you can check your phone Bluetooth fridge for the milk to see if the milk is there. And it's cheaper because, you know, you're the product now. Now they're just going to steal your data and track you on your phone and sell that data. And you're doing that to just have a $400 savings on a fridge. But my brain immediately goes to like, okay, that's what it is now. Like what a helpful tool to like two years from now, the app costs $19 a month. And then four years from now, you cannot open your fridge. Like it is locked unless you connect it to your phone and the app has an active subscription. And then seven years from now, it's like you actually only paid for the premium app, which means you can only open your fridge 117 times per month. And you've already done that and it's only the 26th. So you're gonna have to buy 500 more terabytes of fridge data to open your fridge. And it's just like, I don't want any of this. Like when I was a child, the future seemed really exciting. And now everything's just the worst possible version. Just like your heated seats in your car, that functionality is there. But what if we charged you for it? What if we did that? And it's just, it's just, that's everything now. And I have absolutely no positive feelings towards any human achievement ever. On the one hand, I want to build a space elevator. I think engineering advancements are cool. And even if I don't understand the utility of having a space elevator, we don't live in Star Trek, the engineering advancements we would make while building the space elevator would be worth it to do the thing. We didn't go to the moon for a reason. Like we went because we could and, and now we have GPS and that's great. So we don't really need a reason to build a space elevator whatever we got out of that, the engineering feats that would be accomplished, the new tools, the new materials, it would be worth it and that would be cool. But in my brain, I have this just like capitalism cynicism that's just like, but who wants it? Like 
are they gonna put a giant Vegas orb in space that's just like, hey, do you feel existential dread because you have to stare at the BetterHelp ad? Hashtag BetterHelp therapy. Wouldn't it be funny if I did a BetterHelp ad <laughs> after the whole thing where I was like, I think it's morally wrong to, to, to receive money to give health advice when you're not a doctor. And then I'm just like two episodes later, hashtag better help. All, all I think of is the Coca-Cola company putting a giant unblockable light in the sky. And, and that's, all I, that's, that's, that's all I can think of. Just like someone's gonna do it because they think they can make money by like ruining life for us somehow and making us pay a monthly fee. Like, why do you want a space elevator? A lot of people seem to be working on space elevators until they quickly realize that they're impossible and they stop. But they make a big show of advertising how this is now a space elevator company and then they quietly break it apart like four years later. Anyway, here's the timeline. So between 2005 and 2010, NASA had some Thing with a company called Elevator 2010, so that's 13 years ago, where they had a competition and they gave out prizes and they were like, proof of concept, space elevator, yay, yay. And the program ended in 2010 and was not re-upped for another five years because, you know, we're nowhere near space elevator. That's not happening anytime soon. Uh, there's another one called Robot Games Space Elevator Ribbon Competition, which was associated but not really in 2009. It was the same thing, like proof of concept, win a prize with your thing. In 2005, Liftport, um, Liftport Group Company was formed. That one is a scam because, you know, you can't build a space elevator. So we do the scam. Okay, anatomy of a scam, Liftport. Group. Okay, so 2003, the company's founded. 2004, they do a demonstration at MIT where a lifter is climbing a ribbon outside. It climbs 90 meters and it's like a windy day and everyone's like, oh my God, space elevator. Uh, April 2005, they say they're going to build a carbon nanotube factory in New Jersey because like they're definitely building a space elevator. It, that, the, the factory was never built. Uh, September 2005, they're building a tether, and now the, the climber can climb a thousand feet. Wait, what's 90 meters versus a thousand feet? <laughs> January of 2006, it climbs a mile. They put a little thing in, in the air that's supported by balloons, and they attach the tether, and the thing climbs all the way to the top a mile. Oh my god, that's definitely, you're, you're getting there. Uh, 2007. The company is penalized for illegally selling shares. 2010. The company agrees to cease and desist certain activities in the state of Washington because of the whole scam thing. Don't worry, they're coming back. 2011, we're going to build a lunar space elevator. This is another thing people say, by the way. I'm like, it's impossible to build a space elevator, obviously. And then on the internet, there are people like, well, we don't have the technology now, but... Uh, but, you know, the moon, Mars, they're smaller. Oh, go back to our equation. You see, you have the mass of the body it's on and like the radius of that planet. All of that's related to how the, the density of your cable, right? So if you think about Mars and the Earth, they're much smaller. They're much less massive. They have a much smaller radius. So the strength of your cable is greatly reduced if you build it somewhere else. So people are like, well, we'll just build the, the space elevator on the moon. And again, I'm like, why? Why? Are you gonna harvest helium-3 from the moon? I mean, probably. But like, no, no. Yes, it would be easier to build a space elevator on the moon. Getting people to the moon, getting them to live on the moon while they build the base, getting, how is it powered? What is it doing? How are you getting the helium from the space? Like, it's, it's, like, you're just, like, saying over and over, oh, it'd be easier if the planet was smaller, but, like... If grandmother had wheels, she would have been a bike. <laughs> anyway, the scam company that was, like, seemed to be just a money laundering scam came back out, and they're like, no, 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 in 2011, we're, we're moon lander, lunar elevator land. Um, so in 2012, they make a Kickstarter, and they ask for $8,000, and just... $8,000 is not enough money to do anything, 
And if that's the Kickstarter, like they raised a hundred thousand dollars because people are interested in space elevators. I don't get it. I'm not trying to shit on it. Please explain why you want a space elevator in the comments below. And then you hear nothing. You hear nothing. This, this Kickstarter is still like slightly active. Like you see people responding like a year ago, just like, I haven't heard anything. Where's my t-shirt? Anyway, this is kind of my whole thing with the space elevators. Like scientists are like, oh, a spherical cow problem. We could do a space elevator. And engineers are like, no, what? Even in this lift port company, they had engineers who were like making improvements. And then they all realize like, oh, this is never going to happen. All the engineers leave and you just have the scammers left over. This whole space elevator space is like people who want to live in Star Trek being scammed by scammers. In 2012, a Japanese company, Obayashi, said that in 2050, in 2050, they're going to have a space elevator, a real one that works. And they, they, they wrote a paper about it in 2016, which I don't have access to and nothing has been said since, unless it's in Japanese, because I found lots of websites, I couldn't read it. So yeah, but they, they don't have a space elevator. When would they have to start production? It's 2023? No. No, 2050. No, you're not. Oh my God, stop lying. Okay, so in 2013, a committee or something with the IAA, they, they, they calculated that it's definitely feasible. It's so feasible and nearer than you think to build a space elevator. And they do some math. Again, I can't access this article. And they say that one kilogram to lift to space would only be $500. And how did they get that number? How are you powering it? What's the cable made of? What's the maintenance? How long do you have to replace the cable? Like, I don't know. They say it's good. It's, it's feasible. It's sooner than you think. $500, $500 for a kilogram. Uh, just for comparison, on a rocket right now, it's like a $3,000 to $5,000 per kilogram. So it would be a huge saving. But again, what are you putting in space? Why? What are you putting up there? What's the purpose? You just gonna like eventually you would saturate space with your satellites. What else are you doing up there? What's the purpose? Why? Okay, 2014, Google X. Wait, Google has an X? That's hilarious. Does he know? Um, Google X is rapid evaluation R and D. They they form a team and they're like, we're gonna we're gonna build a space elevator. And within six weeks, they realize that the carbon nanotubes that exist are nowhere near capable. No one's ever built one longer than a meter. There's no way they're gonna do it. So they just shut down their space elevator team. And yeah, good job. Okay, 2018, Japan has a mini version of a space elevator and they launch it as like a proof of concept. It's like really teeny tiny satellite and they're just gonna do it in space. And it says that they did it in September of 2018. And again, I can't, there's no footage of it. I, maybe I'm not good at searching in Japanese, but it launched. That's all I know. Was it successful? Did it do it? Why didn't they take a video? I, I don't know. In 2019, the IAA wrote another article. So this is six years later, they did a little update. And what do you know? It's feasible and it's gonna happen sooner than you think, space elevators. Uh, so I guess we can look forward to another article next year, 2024. And I bet they'll say it's feasible. It's gonna happen sooner than you think. Yeah. So look forward to that. And I mean, IAA, if you're paying people to write that article, I could do it. It's feasible. It's gonna, it's gonna happen sooner than you think.
I re-recorded this, but I don't think I did a better job. I don't understand. What do you want? What are we putting, what are we putting in space? Even more satellites? Block the stars? God forbid anybody wants to do astronomy anymore. It's going to be billboards in space, you guys. It's just going to be billboards in space. I don't want to have to look at that.